We talked about this last month in neighborhood relation. I'm sorry, uh, Landy just brought this forward. Um, it was a presentation called Neighborhoods First and Rethinking I-94. And one of our board members had suggested that Debbie Meister come tonight and give the full presentation to all of us because it is a very important discussion and we all wanted to have as much information as we could before voting on it. So thank you for coming again to District 10. And at this point, I'll turn the screen over to you. Okay, thank you. And I should say I'm in the Snelling Hamlin neighborhood and Neighborhoods First worked on Ide Mill Road for many decades and we finally have a bike and pedestrian path along the road. It's not a linear park, but it's, it's a good start. And we focus on biking, um, transit, and walkability and sustainability in our community. So um, talking about rethinking I-94, I got involved in probably April. I'm on the Union Park Transportation Committee and the chair got me involved, as did uh, Keith Baker from Reconnect Rondo. And it's a loose, from the community aspect, we're a loose group of people who are just concerned about um, what MnDOT and the Federal Highway Department are planning for or thinking about for rethinking I-94. They've scaled back the, the study or the area. It is now on 94, just east of 35W in Minneapolis to Marion Street in St. Paul. And surprisingly, most of it is local traffic. It originates or ends in that corridor. So I think it's only 1% that is totally through traffic. So I think of it as a, a, a city road, community road. Um, the Rethinking I-94 study started in 2016. So the first phase took three years and it was information gathering. There was a community aspect. There were community leaders who met with MnDOT. I wasn't involved in that part. And now we're in the phase two, which is the environmental review. And um, in the, throughout the three years and through now, there's been a lot of changes, staff changes at MnDOT. And so it's, there's, that's had problems with, you know, just community engagement. They really stopped meeting with community leaders. Community leaders um, kept advocating to meet and have input. And now the process is on hold until the beginning of the year. And they have agencies and technical advisory committees that they meet with. And so for phase two, the environmental review process, um, the next step in that is purpose and needs and goals statements for I-94. And it sounds really trivial, but it's very important because it determines what can be studied and shapes the final outcome. So if your issues are not in purpose and needs, they really won't be addressed. And um, so it's really critical and community groups have been meeting and formulating a flyer, which you've all seen, and now we're in iteration 14 with 24 organizations endorsing the flyer. And we use that, um, and does everybody all have the flyer? Because I think it was in your packets. Um, the groups that have been meeting and talking, it's, it's kind of a living document where we've identified issues that we think are important to the community. We don't want an expanded roadway. We would like to see um, mass transit, but we would like them, or a, a min pass lane, but we would like them to regain a lane that's already been used or already there instead of creating a new one. Um, we really want um, less traffic, less vehicle miles traveled, less noise, and um, cleaner air. So those are what we would like to see in the purpose and need statement. 
we'd like to see some mitigation for the harm that's been inf really inflicted on the communities with the um, building of I-94. Um, safer crossings, better connectivity. Um, and then as you can see, the organizations that have endorsed the flyer. Um, so, um, what was it? And as I said, at, as organizations sign on, they've provided input. So it's kind of a, it's a living document that we use. And we use this to educate elected and appointed officials and communities at large, just with what we see as the issues. And taking this flyer, um, we've added, or we've written a letter to MnDOT addressing purpose and needs. We've just made a technical document out of the flyer to address the issues that we would like to see as purpose and needs statements. Um, and it's really, this is all a political process that um, we've been talking to elected officials, especially at the city level, because it's a political fight where if elected officials at the city level um, push these issues, we can win that, the, we can get those things. And we've seen a precedent with 35W in South Minneapolis and I-94 and Highway 252. Um, when the city's Minneapolis made a resolution respond, you know, asking for what they wanted, including a, a min-pass lane and um, some amenities for the community. Um, so I know it's really complicated. It's very technical. And if you Google um, MnDOT rethinking I-94, there are thousands of pages of documents. It outlines the process and the procedures and um, what's been happening so far and also the environmental review process. But for us, um, we want to get this letter sent to MnDOT with CCs to city officials, um, the highway department, the federal highway department, um, Met Council, uh, other elected officials, legislators and such, county commissioners by the end of November because we want to make our voices heard before MnDOT has an official purpose and needs, because once they have a purpose and needs statement, it's really hard to modify that. And right now, the city of St. Paul and the city of Minneapolis both have drafted resolutions um, talking about what they want, which is in great alignment with what we've said. Uh, the mayor's office or the uh, city St. Paul Public Works has sent a very strong letter to MnDOT saying that they want a reduction in vehicle miles traveled. They want to um, address climate change, health, you know, unhealthy air. They want to mitigate what's happened. And so it's looking like we have good allies at the city level. And I, I know this is really complicated and I've tried to just really um, summarize so if anybody has any questions, I, I wasn't really. Uh, yeah, there's um, one from Dan Edgerton, and you, you briefly mentioned talking to people on the federal level, uh, but the question reads, have you been talking to officials and politicians at the federal level? Isn't this where the funding decisions will come from? Um, actually, there is funding. Most of it will be federal dollars. Um, and there's state dollars that need to be included and even some local. And um, right now it has to be on the, uh, what's it called, the STIP, um, which means it has to be in MnDOT's list of projects. 
and there is some money there, but nothing has been allocated yet. So that's why part of this is a, a political issue because um, no funding has yet been allocated. Uh, but everybody does agree that the roadway is in really bad shape and there's water issues and in, you know just infrastructure in general. So it, it is a high priority for MnDOT. And um, Betty McCollum would be a key person to talk to. We've been talking really with city council members, state reps, um, Met Council, uh, of course, MnDOT. And we anticipate continuing conversations. So the question before our board tonight is, um, Debbie and her group is asking for our endorsement of the flyer. It is in your board packet. I believe it's page number four. Um, it's a color, two-sided color document. Um, and also uh, to present any suggestions to the flyer, if you think there are any changes that need to be made or improvements, and then to sign the letter as it is or again with suggestions. So basically, if you look on the second page of that flyer, there's a whole list of people and organizations that have endorsed the flyer. And that's what the question is before us tonight is if we're willing to put our name on this flyer along with the many others. So given that purpose, and hopefully you've had a chance to look over this or checked out the website, are there any questions or comments for Debbie pertaining to the flyer that, that's been presented to us or other questions about the project in general would be fine. I have a quick question um, and that's just in regards to the fact that you would call the flyer a living document. So if this flyer is gonna be continuing to be updated and all that, I, I'm just, I, I guess if we are going to be signing our name as approving what's on the uh, on the flyer and the flyer then changes in the future, how does that work? So I'm just um, we meet, the endorsees will be meeting next week, uh, and you know, and we have people continually signing on. That's why more endorsements to come because we do have organizations that are in different. Um, levels of endorsing. Some are at committee level, some are at full boards. And so as endorsements come, we just revi um, revise. Um, we've just made tweaks as people, you know, have a wordsmith here, word there, um, and we send them out to anybody, everybody who's endorsed the flyer. Um, we will be meeting next week with the organizations to finalize the flyer and the letter because we want to send the letter by the end of the month um, because like I said we really want to get in and have our issues known before anything is officially drafted from MnDOT because then it's really hard to change it and we also want um, elected and appointed officials to know where community members are standing and, and our top issues. Debbie, how would, how would you communicate with us uh, going forward if there are changes to the documents, your progress, that kind of thing? Um, we send out the flyer. I would send it to Michael, unless somebody, you know, and then I would assume that everything would go okay. to the board or the committees or whomever. So there's a process set up to communicate with everybody who's endorsing? Yes, and Sierra Club is, kind of convening all, all of the 24 of us right now. And we're adding people as new endorsees come on. Okay, thank you. Um, are community members allowed to ask a question or is this just for the board at this moment? Maria, please feel free to ask any question. It's open to anyone that's online. Just the voting part is for the board. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I just, I put my question in the chat box, but I can just ask it here. Um, so I just said, you mentioned communities that were affected by the building of I-94, and I know that one of those was the Rondo community. Yes. 
um, the building of the highway didn't just break up the community, but it also played into redlining practices and decreased housing costs, which affect that neighborhood now. And so I was just wondering how you plan to give back to the Ronto community um, in terms of power. So that could be financially, that could be um, allowing them autonomy in um, kind of how the highway is constructed in that in their community. Um, I didn't see that on the flyer, so I just wanted to ask about that. Um, actually, that was um, the opening paragraph talks about mitigation and the harm that has been done and that the fact that we really need to acknowledge that and do something about it. We talk about connectivity quite a bit um, and restoring land with freeway lids or land bridges. Um, and that's, we're being very, um, we're not being real prescriptive, we're, but we're really talking about the injustices that were done and the fact that we really do need to address that, especially, you know, and we're talking about air, we're talking about noise, we're talking about um, aesthetics, we're talking about bridging so that people can cross north to south because that was um, truly harming. Um, all the neighborhoods where you, you really can't go north and south easily. So we've outlined many of these issues and then we've made those technical arguments in the purpose and needs. We want those to be primary purpose and needs, not secondary as um, MnDOT was proposing. So um, does seeing the flyer now, does that address the questions? That does, yeah, is that, I was just, um, I'm a public health student and, and my focus is really on um, like community engaged practice. Did that, did those ideas um, come from the community? I just think about um, how, um, just like, were there any plans to actually put money back into the community? So most of the plans sound like infrastructure, which is really important. I was just wondering if those, also came from the Rondo community as well. Yeah, the Rondo community, Reconnect Rondo is a sign, they, they've endorsed this. And we've been meeting regularly with Reconnect Rondo folks um, and the other 23 groups. Um, everybody's, all the organizations have had input and that's, um, that's how we, you know, we just, a group of three or four drafted the flyer and then just sent it out and everybody's been, you know, with, with their perspectives, bringing new thoughts and angles to the table. So I think it's a stronger document just because we've had so many eyes and so many organizations with their perspectives adding to this. Another question that came through the chat um, from Jill says, I'm noticing organizations like Summit University, Planning Council, Frogtown Neighborhood Association, Aurora Street, Anthony, NDC, and others are not on your list. Have you reached out to them? Yes, we have many times and we're still working with them and we're working also with Dietau's office working with them. So um, they're concerned about gentrification. They're concerned about um, the land bridge and um, some other issues, which, um, you know, we're in constant talking with them and okay. hoping that they would add to the dialogue, come, you know, and bring some issues forward. Another question that is from Michael. You mentioned restoring the transit lane. Do you know how traffic volumes have changed in the I-94 corridor over time? Oh, that's on the website. And I can't, you know, tell you numbers right off. It's really, it, the congestion happens during rush hour. That's, and as much as you build, congestion is the, you know, it's, you we're, I believe you can't build yourself out of it. It's induced, you know, the more lanes you have, just the more traffic you get. So um, we're just looking at how can we actually reduce vehicular miles traveled? 
and we feel like we really need a strong transit system and we need options for pedestrians and, and bikes and other modes of transportation, you know, wheelchairs or whatever, so that we can move um, through the corridor in, in many different ways. And so that's where we're saying that we would like to see our, the emphasis put instead of expanding because we know it's not going to help. And another question came in um, regarding autonomous vehicles. So the question is, do traffic estimates account for future changes due to autonomous vehicles? We could be seeing very different roadway usage even within the next decade. And so the suggestion for the flyer is to add some language to incorporate flexibility into the design to address expected changes in transportation technologies. So that I might have not to say this really is the first questions. this is the first time I've heard that from any of the communities that we've chatted with. So that has not come up anywhere, and I don't remember seeing it even in the MnDOT documents in their studies. So um, I can say I can't answer that question, and I don't know anybody who's actually put that out, but I will bring that to the group on um, Monday or Tuesday of next week, week when we meet. And the last question I see here is about safety. Um, it's kind of a broad question. There's higher crime and pedaling. Perhaps the question pertains to how would this redesign help to lower crime rates? I'm just interpreting here. No, my concern is because of the pedaling, the crime rate that's over there, if they're going to put a whole bunch of money into trying to reconnect this and build this up, what are they doing to support the safety of the community, of the community members, reduce the crime? If you talk about dumping millions of dollars, what are we going to do? Is there going to be cameras up? Are they going to stop peddlers from being over there? Um, more patrols to help reduce it? Because if we're dumping a bunch of money somewhere, what are they going to do as far as safety as well? Thank you, Melissa. We're talking about increased lighting. Um, as far as increased police, um, those are those wouldn't be in the primary um, statements for purpose and need. I don't believe, but and it would be a that would be the city issues too for policing. So those are kind of the little bit more of the intangibles that um, the communities would discuss all along. I mean, I, I think crime is just, we talk about it all the time and I don't know I-94 directly, um, although with the lighting and the better connections, you know, if you have a better, more visible connection where people feel safer, the more, you know, kind of safety in numbers too. Some of these crossways are really um, kind of sketchy. So we're just looking at enhancing the whole area. I, I don't know if that's addressing specifically because I think some of it's a policing issue too. And um, money would have to come for in many places and many partnerships would have to be um, fostered to implement a lot of the things that we would like to see for mitigation. I know one thing I would like to see, because I used to take that exit often, coming from downtown exit and on Dale, when mm -hmm. we would take a right to go north on Dale, we couldn't see beyond the bridge. So even though to take a right, we had the right away, we it was still so scary because of the, you know, the fencing on the bridge, we couldn't see. Is that something that will be addressed, either make it a little wider, cut the fence, you know, a little way better because to the left, I couldn't see the cars coming, even though technically even on a red light, I could take a right. And that's just, you know, kind of a safety concern that I had. Those are all the issues. And I don't know, I haven't followed the Dale, um, the Dale improvements. I don't know if anybody else can address that. Um, I can't, but I know that all of the connections would be addressed in this study. I know that the Dale Street Bridge is being redone right. right now and being finalized. And my understanding is it's supposed to help address that 
that right turn question. I, Cause I run into that too. If you're coming from the east and you exit at Dale and you wanna go right onto Dale, it's always dicey. Uh, and so often I don't even do the right on red cause it's, done, it's not safe. Um, but I believe they're, you know, through turn lanes, things like that, and just changing how, you know, the sight lines, supposedly it's supposed to be improved. I guess we'll have to see, but it's definitely was one of their design considerations. I know that. Dan, there's a question about the timing of construction and when it's supposed to start. Oh, this is years down the pike because first they have to do the they have to do the um, purpose and needs and the evaluation criteria and the goals, and then from there they um, have the study, and then from the study they choose a um, an option, the preferred option, and then they start with contracting for um, engineering and um, put it out for bid. So um, we're talking a couple of years for study and implementation. The only thing I missed, it looks like was a comment. It just seems that you need advocates among the state and federal politicians more than the cities. That was a comment. Actually, the cities play a very key role because they have to write a, a letter of consensus. Um, and right now, both Minneapolis and St. Paul have sent letters basically saying they're not consenting to um, what's been proposed. And because they have climate plans, they have their, each city has a plan where they have goals to reduce air emissions, you know, carbon for climate change. And they're saying that they want this to be primarily addressed with this project and they're not seeing it. So um, when I said it was a political issue, it's really, um, if the communities and the cities say, this is what we want, we have a lot of political clout to make it happen. We also have, um, um, Governor Walls, who has climate goals and is more receptive than when 35W was being proposed. Um, another question came in. Do you think that because of the pandemic and lower traffic, that will change the project? Um, I, I prob probably not. I think what will change the project is um, community advocacy and strong support from the cities to change it. it, it just an add on to that, has it been addressed? Because there is, um, because of the prolonged pandemic, there is a somewhat documented shift and I think there's a trend toward more work at home permanently, although yeah. not, you know, to the same extent, but, yeah. but um, it seems like that should be addressed somewhere in, in the overall plan, uh, even from MnDOT. You know, it's interesting because all their planning and all their studies were done in phase one and way before the pandemic. And this might be some of the issues that have kind of stalled the project now and put it on hold till um, the beginning of the year. I think that, um, yeah, the, the virus and staff changes and all these things might be part of that. But I haven't heard of them, you know, planning to undertake new studies with the new models and such. But those are really good points. And I think um, it's a good thing to, to address. Okay, any other questions? Again, the purpose of this meeting is for the board to vote on and approve this flyer and to list our name at the bottom of the second page as um, another organization that endorses the flyer. So with that being said, any There's other questions? Or question comments? In the chat, um, oh, is there another one? About the frontage roads, um, are those part of the project or is that a separate jurisdiction for the city? Um, that's part of it. And actually, um, 
talking to Russ Stark from the mayor's office, um, they would like to um, acquire the frontage road, have it be a city road so that they can take one of the lanes and make it a bike pedestrian lane and narrow the frontage road. That was coming out of the mayor's office um, with some other great ideas about adding solar, adding native vegetation on the north side, you know, for a sound barrier. So um, we're finding some really good ideas coming out of the mayor's office. And hopefully in the resolution too that the city council is working on. Any other, no, there's nothing else in the chat right now. Any other questions or comments? No? Okay. Um, let's see. We had this come to us from a committee last time, and they presented, not as well as Debbie did tonight, but they, they presented uh, some of the larger points to it. Seeing that we've had that done last time, I don't think we need to have a motion to approve the flyer. I mean, a second to approve the flyer. We can move ahead to a vote. Um, I'm looking at Olivia and I think she thinks I'm right. <laughs> okay, so I'm obviously not gonna read you the flyer. I hope you have it in front of you, but at this moment in time, I would like the board members um, to vote in favor of endorsing the flyer as is, but as Marika highlighted, this is a living document. So my intention in us voting in favor of endorsing the flyer is that the spirit of the content will stay the same. Absolutely. So the yes. graphical changes or editing in terms of word choice, etc. But what we've discussed in terms of the purpose of this flyer and the key points about um, trying to mitigate harm from communities that have been negatively impacted in, it in the past, as well as some of the environmental concerns, all of those things are there. So with that said, unless there's any objections, we'll move ahead to a vote. Um, yeah, I do have an objection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a concern that maybe the timing isn't right. Um, I guess I don't feel very good that the organizations of color and the communities of color have not already been kind of, you know, talked to and that their input hasn't been a part of this yet. So. That's just my concern. And if we're going to vote on it, I would probably vote no, just because of the timing. So I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the only okay. thing I see on the document thus far is the African Economic Development Solutions has signed on, but maybe Debbie, okay. you can speak to where those communities are in this process, because you said you have spoken with them. Uh, yes. Um... Actually, and they've been invited many times to the table. Well, we do have um, in Little Africa too, and Reconnect Rondo are all signing on. And um, like I said, we, we're in dialogue, especially with Frogtown Summit uh, University. Dayton's Bluff is um, really supportive of it. They haven't officially signed on, but they're. Um, it's under advisement or it's somewhere in their committee board process. Um, and we're doing outreach, you know, as we speak, we're talking to organizations um, and we have been. In fact, you know, since, well, Reconnect Rondo started, I think, convening organizations back in March and all, and Frogtown and Summit U and all these, um, were always invited to the table. And I've been talking with them regularly since August. So. Jill, I have a add on to that. I think that's a really, really excellent point. Um, and whether there have been conversations, if they haven't joined on, is there a reason? And perhaps should we postpone and defer to the neighborhoods that are most affected and adjacent to the project in particular you know, the neighborhoods of, of color and traditionally disenfranchised. You know, what we can do and what we have done is invite people to the table. 
And I, I cannot talk to why or why they haven't, you know, been involved or have input. It's, and so I just say, I, this is an issue that's affecting all of us. You know, we all have asthma, we have cancers, we have, you know, um, we all suffer from noise and I, I want my voice heard. And your community can decide to wait, but my community, I'm, you know, I'm being affected and I'm at the table because I care. And I can't, you know, force people to come. I don't know what the issue is, but I'm just saying I'm an activist because I care. I care about my neighbors and myself, you know, and all of us. So I'm here because I want to be. And I celebrate people who come to the table and we keep asking and that's what we can do. So, you know. Yeah, I'm just wondering though, why if, you know, the most affected communities don't feel, I mean, aren't even, you know, leaders. I mean, Rondo we is. Ask. <laughs> we have, I, you know, it's. Yeah, I mean, is it? Well, there are political issues that it's not for me to get into. It's, and it's not necessarily with this flyer. Yeah, because I, I agree. I think I'm in favor, but I agree with Jill. I think um, I'd really like to see the adjacent neighbors of color who are right there. Um, Some are not just not just be invited. Like you know, hey, we're doing this thing. You're invited, but you know that that it's really coming from them. So I, 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 I'd probably wait too. And well, John, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I was invited by Reconnect Rondo in my neighborhood, Union Park. Mm -hmm. We jumped in because yeah. we care. And, yeah. you know, the invitations mm -hmm. have been extended. They've gotten many iterations of the flyer. Um, when I think when only five were communities signed on or organizations and you know it's been exp expanding and, and I really um, I can't address why or why not they're there I'm just saying the organizations that signed on care and want to make our voices heard so um, and it's a range of people <laughs> so I and most, you know, we started with people along the corridor and, and, you know, now we're expanding farther out, which is Como, you know, and when we talk to elected officials and they ask about so-and-so, you know, those are the next groups that we, that we call. Is there a timeline for kind of gathering the approvals for this? Is there like a period we could just kind of postpone to see if we can, you know, support... Um, for add our support at that point? You can sign on anytime you want. Um, you know, like I'm saying, we're just always gathering. We will be sending the letter, which is the technical piece mm -hmm. to MnDOT at the end of November because okay. there is a timeline. But you can write a letter anytime with whatever issues you, mm -hmm. you, know, you want. You have what, what um, and it's not all these groups, but it's probably 15 groups mm -hmm. that are signing on to the letter. And some will write their own. And, you know, I don't know. So you can have other points, but we were just, we just took this flyer and made it technical. Yeah. Do you have a sense if there are pushbacks or, you know, issues that other communities are having that they're not signing on? Or, you know, what what's the... <sighs> yeah resistance? You know, there's so many issues that people are dealing with right now. Some of them just thought we would have more time. And, you know, because building isn't going to be for two years. But the thing is, if you don't get what's studied, you, you lose really the opportunity. Yeah. So even though it seems like it's way far away, it really isn't. And I don't mm -hmm. think everybody feels the urgency. I do, but yeah, I understand. Okay, thank you. Th those are the 
questions I have. Okay. Melissa, may I raise a point of information? Yes, and you're very quiet. That's a change. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I tend not to try to enter a board debate, but I just want to raise a point of information. So of the, of the neighborhood associations or district councils in which the Interstate 94 Highway actually runs through, um, you know, Debbie said Dayton's Bluff is, is in the process. Um, and so moving west, Summit University is not here. They would be the only one that I can tell along the actual corridor that has not weighed in. But um, that's true. Lex, that, that Lex Ham has weighed in, Hamlin Midway has weighed in, Union Park has weighed in, and St. Anthony has weighed in. So of the, of the neighborhood associations that are through which the highway actually runs, um, everybody except Summit University seems to be either having signed on or have it under consideration. And so other district councils would be um, not actually having the highway run through it. They would be much like us in, in a, an adjacent council um, that the Neighborhoods First seems to be seeking support from. So thank you for allowing me to do that. Thank you, Michael. So my role as the chair is to try to find consensus and also to provide you all with the procedures to get the work done that we want to do. So right now we do have um, this flyer before us. Like we did last month, however, someone presented a motion to table the vote until we heard more from Debbie. That's always an option again. If, if you feel like you'd like to wait for other, um, they're almost tangential, you know, districts. They're not right on that corridor to weigh in, that is an option tonight as well. So um, as it reads right now, the action requested is moved Como Community Council endorses the tenants, I like that Marika, of rethinking I-94 and support the ideas presented on the flyer shared at the October 2020 Land Use Committee meeting. Um, so that is, the action item, yet again, we, we can table this if someone would like to make that motion and if the board votes to go that way. I, I also have a question if there's a way that we could get more specific in how federal money and state money would go to reparations towards the communities that were impacted by the initial 94 corridor. Because right now it's very, very... It's, it's too general and I don't like, where's that money gonna go? Is that like to one tree or, and they consider that good enough or like, is this gonna help businesses of color that were impacted or housing in that area? I just, I, I'm concerned by how vague it is of how, of what sort of, sort of steps will be taken to reconcile that trauma that was put on that community. Well, right now there is absolutely no money dedicated to this project at all. It will be state and federal funding and it'll be completed in phases. And also probably local funding will be asked for. So um, that's just the beast of the way these things are. And um, we're probably looking at partnerships for some of the mitigation with possibly foundations and everything else. And so it, it it's kind of like, you know, making sausage. It's just, and there isn't a good answer and there isn't, you know, dedicated so, money right now. So if that's the case, wouldn't you want to ask big now and go big or go like, right now is our opportunity to try to get as much possible in reparations or some sort of something for these communities that impacted instead of just being so vague, wouldn't we want to be more, wouldn't it, not we, but wouldn't it, you as an organization um, asking for this want to be more specific? Um, we want to be, and that's why we did the purpose and needs. This is what we're saying is needs to be in this study because we're just asking right now for what we want. We want transit, bikes, and pedestrians to be a primary need, not a secondary. We want to reduce vehicle miles traveled. We want to have air um, noise, 
um, considered, you know, to be a primary. And so, and, and it, this is just the way, it's a really, um, it's a really complicated process. And it's, you're not really asking for funding right now, you're asking for what can be studied and what will be evaluated. And so uh, it's- I think it'd be interesting if there's a way maybe to find a way to study the social, like- That's what we're asking for. If you read our purpose and needs, which is the letter, we're yeah. taking all the stuff in the flyer and saying, this is important, you need to study this. This has yeah. to be a goal, this has to be a purpose. And um, yeah, it seems like the social equity part of it seems very vague and not- Right. To yeah. me, it doesn't seem important enough, and it seems almost as like a second thought. And I think if we're going to be doing anything in this area, we need to have that be. And, and you can, you know, take the letter that we drafted and send in your own too. So you could, you know, beef up those pieces if you wanted. Um, and that's, it, it, it's just a really complicated process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I totally understand. Thank you. Yeah, I, I had a question. Uh, Debbie, you're talking about, you know, we want this and we want that. And, and my question kind of is, who exactly is we? Um, I was I see the, the various endorsements, but I don't see like a single entity. I think what you really want or we really want, you really want is a seat at the table as these discussions go forward. And who, who would that seat before, you know, because there's whatever, 20 entities here. Uh, and I don't know that 20 different entities are all going to be sitting at the table. Is there, is there some voice? Is there some entity that will represent, you know, some sort of coalition that represents these folks or this? I think that has a community or... leaders group. So we are at the table that way. And they kind of terminated us. And now they're, they're, inviting us back and they do have, they meet with agencies and technical um, groups and the cities are at the table, the Met Council's at the table, legislators are at the table. And if you go on their website, you can see the committees and then who's on them. Okay, I should Does, let you see me. Yeah. Um, and it's thousands of you know pages of documents. Yeah, yeah, but I'm just thinking. It just seems like an amorphous thing. Like, who are you? Who are we? You know, it's some sort of group of folks, and I don't exactly know what that is. You don't. It's not like a name or an organization or anything other than some community members. Which I don't know. Maybe that's adequate, but it seems as though you almost want something a little more formalized if you want to try to start speaking with a voice and, and have some sort of standing in terms of this, this discussion. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of individuals, it seems like, that are sort of banding together to do a thing. It, it seems to me, it's just a thought. It's, a, it's something you want, might want to think about is, because there's not someone here, some overriding organization that says, we're pushing this and we are endorsed by these other folks as well. And it just occurred to me now that I don't know who who all you are, because it doesn't really say. Well, we're, we are the organizations that's, that endorse the flyer. That's who we are. And Sierra Club is, is convening us, but nobody is, you know, it's not formal in that. It's just, we're, and then we're meeting with elected officials and we're meeting with MnDOT we are, and anybody who wants to be in the community leader, organizations can send a representative. And so those are organizations that have been meeting with MnDOT. And then loosely we've been meeting together just because we see it as an issue and we see it as collectively our voices are stronger. I don't know if, you know, that answers your question, but it's, and it's worked in the past. It's how, you know, 35W and, I-94, 252 projects got refocused because, and it was kind of this approach. So we're using the same approach because it worked twice.
Well, I would like to move that we table it and Jill? think more about it later. Yeah. Second. I agree. Okay, we have um, a motion from Jill, a second from Mike. I think we've had quite a bit of discussion already. All right. so we are making a um, vote here to table this. Um, all those, well, before I say that, Jill, is there, um, I guess, a certain point, either time or developmentally, that you would like to see in order to take this um, action back up in the future? A really good question. Um, I don't know how other you know, others feel about it, but I feel like, I don't know, a month or two, I feel like there's some answers or some questions that we need some answers to. And so I don't know if, I don't know if it's enough time to bring it back right away next month. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, sometimes I like to table things with the date. <laughs> Tabling them for infinite time doesn't make sense to me. So it's just what I'm trying to gauge here. And so again, we're voting to table this to a future time. What we'll do, I think, for um, the officers is we'll keep a placeholder in our minutes, in our meeting, to talk about it and bring it up at the full board. That way we can hit it so we don't forget. That's my main concern. We had such great discussion. This is a very important project. We have a lot of people that are engaged in this, so we definitely need the placeholder. So again, for the vote to table, all those in favor, please say aye. Can I can I bring something up before we vote? Sure. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I guess um, just a couple thoughts. One, actually, I'm going to vote no because I don't feel the need to table it. I'm ready to vote yes for it. But having said that, I understand some people, if they're at all uncertain, they want to delay. But rather than just voting, tabling based on a time, I almost feel as though it's not so much a matter of time. It's we, we should almost table it pending resolution of certain questions. And we should mm -hmm. figure out what are those things we need to know before we're going to be able to uh, make a decision. And I, I feel like if we just table it with no sort of idea for what purpose or, you know, mm -hmm. for what, I, I think it just makes more sense to say, let's table it until we find out something. And then that, that seems like that would be also something that Debbie could work to address and say, okay, they need this and this and this from us before they're ready to support we're not really telling her exactly. There's sort of a general bring on communities of color, but it's really amorphous what, what we're looking for, I think. That's just my thought. Sure. Well, we can say that we would like to see Summit University Planning Council come on board. We would like to see Dayton's Bluff come on board. I would still like to hear from the Frogtown Neighborhood Association in District 7. And I love Sarah's comment about let's get some reparations funding in there. You know, just to just to look at it, to look at the potential of doing that. So is that specific enough? So I just have a I have a question. Does that mean that you or this board would reach out to these other organizations and ask if they intend? Like would we further investigate their intention and ask what their thoughts on are, are on it, or would we be then asking Debbie to go back to these people and and try to use our vote as a leverage to get them on board? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> it would be easier it, for us if Debbie could do that, <laughs> but I understand you've tried. Um, but it sounds like there's still an opportunity to potentially with these organizations, and um, you know, certainly feel free to chat with them. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, if District Seven is holding out, I mean, I still think it's worthwhile to wait and see what Summit University Planning Council is going to do. And was it Dane's Bluff, the other one? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's, it's I got, before their committees and board. Dayton's bluff. I was, maybe it's timing. 
Would, um, would this also be a role for the anti-racist group maybe to reach out and do some research on this and come back to the board? I'm just asking our group as a whole if that would be a helpful thing. Can I just add, I don't, I don't think this is, we're trying to leverage any, any other groups to, to make a decision. I haven't heard that really come up as, as the point. I think we're, we're just trying to understand if this is truly a, you know, benefit and, and all parties feel it's a benefit. Um, you know, I think we just want to feel, at least if, feel like I'd, I'd like to see that certainty from those, sure. you know, more directly um, adjacent yeah. and impacted. But um, I mean, overall, I, I agree. I just, uh, to Jill's point, I think us coming in as a second is a better position and timing. And I, I think Jill, your original point was about timing. So, mm -hmm. um, and I think if we can just get an update at some point, maybe it's the end of the month before you submit it, um, you know, just what's happening, uh, where the outreach is, um, if decisions have been made by those uh, other groups, it may help us feel more confident that, um, you know, no groups have been disenfranchised in the, pro in the process. Yeah, I've just heard Debbie say that they've been reached out to and it, it seems like um, there's only so much she can do to try to mm -hmm. get people on board. So um, where were we with all of this, Melissa? <laughs> we were in the middle of <laughs> approving, a, the, tabling this. Um, so we already had a, a first and a second. And the only other thing that I could offer to you guys in terms of, of strategy or, or getting work done is when we work as a full board, it's a little more cumbersome because there are so many different people talking about this. Again, it came out of land use. Um, someone had mentioned the racism work group potentially that could be a group to, to move this forward and discuss it and firm it up, the things that we felt were too ambiguous or just, you know, there was no detail. They could work on that. Um, Debbie mentioned we don't have to sign their letter. We can make our own letter. However, as a whole board trying to write a letter, that's very cumbersome. So what I'm suggesting is Yes, we can table it tonight, but with the intention of a specific group within our district council to either draft their own letter or to work on this further so that we can all then agree on that letter um, and send it forward if we choose to. The tabling has to be voted upon though, correct? Yeah, it's been first there. It's been seconded, so we do have to vote on that. Okay, and there's been a request to do a roll call, so... Um, I think we're gonna have to have everybody say their vote. Can I can I add one more thing just about like where, if we're gonna add any language about where it goes. So this, this came out of land use originally. Um, I will say based on the feedback that we're getting here from the full board, um, it's possible that this may be better to kick back to the anti-racist group because I think it sounds like most of our, most of the concerns that people are raising have to do more with I think the community and social justice aspects of this rather than kind of like any city policy. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. So Jill, let me ask you this question because you had the motion originally. Yeah. Are you comfortable with us and also to you, Mike, since you seconded it for the um, tabling of it, not simply to be a time of waiting, but an assignment to a specific group of people within D10 to work on this. It, would that be acceptable for you? Yeah, sure. Sure. I, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with it going to the anti-racism group. I, I only hesitate because we've, we're already working on a lot of stuff, but this is central to what we're working on, so it actually is a really good fit. Good, Mike, do you concur as the one that seconded the motion? I apologize, I got booted out of Zoom and I missed what was just said. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, in short, we would um, <laughs> vote to, to table this um, endorsement of the letter tonight and that we would assign it to the anti-racism work group where they can either draft their own letter, um, seek out those organizations that haven't signed on yet, have a dialogue and work on those points that weren't clear enough for the board to take action tonight. And then they bring it back to the board? Correct. For action, yep, my second still stands. Okay, any discussion or questions on that? Okay, so just to be clear, we're voting to table the endorsement of the flyer and the letter, and it will be assigned to the anti-racism work group, and they have all the time they want to work on this, and when they're finished, they would bring it back to the board. Okay, with that being said, all those, in, do we still want a roll call vote? Does this feel more universal? I think that was a term. Deborah, do you, are you okay with a... That that with that change, I would be comfortable, but I'm not... I'm not certain that it's still going to be, you know, all just so we make sure we pause enough to register if there are some negative votes or, okay. you know what I mean? Yep. Okay. All those in favor of tabling this vote and assigning it to the anti-racism work group, please say aye or raise your hand. Hands would be helpful. Then we can count. Michael, are you getting 10 people? We have two people that I don't have a camera for. Keep your hands up just so we can see. I've got 11 and Melissa's camera's off. That should carry it. Michael, you're on mute. Uh, Melissa Brandon's hand is up. Okay, so that carries it. But we will count the nays, all those Opposed, please put your hands up. Okay, any abstaining? No. The motion passes. So thank you, Debbie, um, for your time and for answering all these questions. I think you'll realize that our, our council were very um, circumspect and thorough when it comes to these decisions because we do care deeply about our neighborhood and we do care deeply about the wounds that have happened in the past and we just really want to make sure going forward it doesn't happen again. Do you want to have any closing thoughts to share? No, I just thanks for your time and keep me posted and if you need any questions answered um, just ask. Okay well thank okay. you. Okay bye-bye. Have a good evening. You too.